I found my purpose a few years ago, and my purpose is to inspire and empower others to see the possibility and the things that they have in front of them, to look at what they have, see that they can do it, and really embrace with the, their inner badass because they have the confidence to do that. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is four things, which is really about when you're working with individuals, how do you meet them where they're at? And when you're creating experiences, how do you meet them where they're at? The second thing is, my favorite quote out there is, everything speaks. And it's a quote by Walt Disney. And if you keep that in mind in everything that you do, you will just naturally build a positive brand for your company and for you as an individual. And you'll have people around you that want to be around you. The third thing is, knowledge and experience breeds confidence. And once you have confidence, you've got the ability to embrace your inner badass. It gives yourself permission. And then the fourth thing is, all boats rise. So how did I learn these things, and why am I talking about this today? So I actually spent 19 years with a company when it was started as a startup. I was actually a computer programmer, of all things. And over the next 19 years, we grew this 15-person operation where we were doing marketing to a 3,000-employee international operation where we did customer care all over the world. And I had the honor to go from being a computer programmer to eventually running all of the operations, becoming CFO, and eventually becoming CEO in the last few years that I was there. And it was an incredible experience. It's things that... You know, I look back and I think about the knowledge and the experiences and the challenges and the rewards and the things that came along with it. I could never buy anywhere and I would never trade for millions and millions of dollars because it was a unique opportunity for me to learn about business, about learning about people, how to deal with clients, how to sell, all that kind of stuff. So at the end of 19 years, um, we had basically, I was a second generation owner and my job at the end was to maximize the payout of the last 50% of the company that we were selling back to a parent company. And I did that. So after the end of 19 years, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? Like many of the business owners that we all deal with, I had no idea what my purpose, what my plan was. The only thing is I had done a great job negotiating a package at the end, and I had a one year to figure it out. Um, but I was never a person to sit around and wait before that time came for me to leave. So about five months before I left the organization I was with, I was out to dinner with a friend, and I realized, you know what? I had this network, but my network was all related to the business that I'd been in 19 years. And this is a challenge a lot of business owners face. And this was my whole network. But I realized when I walked away from that business, I don't know that I wanted to stay connected to everyone in that network. In some ways, I needed to leave that, next cha that last chapter behind. So I was thinking to myself, how do I meet other people? And I had worked most of my career with men. And no offense, guys, I love working with you. But I just wanted to hang out with some women for a change. So I was meeting with a friend and thought, what better way? By the way, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And that relates to the part, part of the story which is I was hanging out with a friend, and I said, I want to meet other women who have nothing to do with my work, my spouse, or kids. And got to thinking, well, why not do that over bourbon? So anybody in if I say bourbon? So bourbon, bourbon, right? Being from Kentucky, this was in 2014, and bourbon was just really starting to pick up traction. And everybody in Louisville, when you met somebody from Louisville, you just assumed they knew what bourbon was about. And But for women, you weren't expected to know. We weren't supposed to have a place at the bar. We were going to be those one, We were basically still learning and catching up. And a lot of people looked at when you ordered a drink as a woman and go up to the bar and say, I want a straight bourbon or I want a straight old Forster on the rocks. They look at you like, wow, okay. Um, or my favorite is I'd, my husband order wine and I'd order a bourbon and they put the wine in front of me and the bourbon in front of him. Which, by the way, I have a T-shirt that says the, bourbon, the whiskey's for me, not him. So with that, I, started to, I decided to throw my first event. And part of it, we sent out a message out um, to all the friends that I had. And I was like, we're going to do this bourbon event. We went and worked with a local venue to put together 
um, just a bourbon tasting and some cocktails and that kind of stuff. Well, I was fortunate enough to plan that on a January 6th night. Don't ever plan events in January, and you've got a, a place that can freeze in snow and everything like that. So there was this huge snowstorm that came in three days before. It was freezing cold, dropped down to six degrees, which in Louisville it gets cold, but it doesn't quite get down to six degrees very often. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be lucky if I have five friends show up that night. We had 35 women that came out that night to learn about bourbon. And so what I found out was that we found something in common. We discovered that we all had this interest in this place. We wanted to learn more. So you know what? After I did that, I'm cocky. I now know how to throw bourbon events, right? So we decided, we know what we're doing. Let's do a bourbon tasting, okay? So I went to one of the local bourbon bars, one of the more popular ones, and I went to the owner who was known in the community as a top aficionado on bourbon, and I said, we want to do a bourbon tasting. And he's like, he was all about it. He goes, I've never done one for women. I am excited about doing this for women. So I get there. And he lines up this whole tasting force, and it was like six, seven bottles of bourbon. And even me, who grew up in Kentucky, drank bourbon a lot of my life. I was intimidated by this lineup. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So he got up there, and he just got all excited. He was so excited about what he was doing. He jumped right into it, and he talked about bourbon and how you made it and went around and around in the history and all this stuff and talking about this, talking about this, talking about that. Well, in the middle of it, I got a friend in the back that texted me saying, when are we going to drink? <laughs> and so I thought, oh, gosh, we got we to get this going. So we ended up, I, I politely interrupted him and said, hey, um, are we going to taste anything? So he proceeded to do a tasting. And he didn't think about who his audience was. And that was the place where I go back to meet people where they are. We took this taste, and all of a sudden you could hear this coughing in the in the room because we didn't teach and we didn't show them how to drink bourbon and what how to do and what you need to do to prepare yourself for it plus a lot of these women had never drank bourbon before in their life they were there to learn but it started to turn them off because they didn't know they were scared they were intimidated this sound familiar sometimes when we're talking about business owners they get scared they get intimidated they put their blinders on and they start to check out Well, if you've ever been in a room with women who start to check out, the chatter gets really loud. It starts to get really, really loud. And there was one woman in the back of the room that saved the whole thing. She raised up her hand and she said, excuse me, I drink wine. How do I get into drinking bourbon? And I got to give the guy credit. This light bulb went on and he said, hold on a minute. And he went right back out and he came back about 15 minutes later with a whole tray of old fashions. The whole mood, the whole party completely changed. And from that moment on, it it taught me that you need to remember to meet people where they are. And every event after that that we started to throw, we always made sure we had something for that novice, something for that enthusiast, and something for that connoisseur. And I think as advisors, we've got to remember that we have people that are novices. There are people that are enthusiastic. You've got people that are experienced. But we've got to remember not everybody's on the same level, and we can't talk to them the same way. We can't expect them to react the same way. We have to remember they're coming to the table with their own things. They're coming to their table with their own wants, needs, and fears. And when you start to tap in and begin to consider what those wants, needs, and fears are, you can start to build a much better experience. So I'll get to my second point, which is about everything speaks. So I had this great aunt who was known for throwing these fabulous parties. And one of the things that the holidays she was known for was these big trays of cookies. You know, those ones that had about 50 types of cookies on it. And I was always amazed by them because they were absolutely beautiful. They were perfect. Well, I got to be a brave soul one weekend around the holidays to volunteer. I'm going to go work. I'm going to go hang out with my Aunt Mary Catherine and learn how to make these cookies. I'm thinking I'm going to be there for like three hours, four hours. I was there from 6 in the morning to about 11 p.m. that night made every cookie you can imagine. And through that process, we probably threw out more than we kept because she was so particular on what cookie went on which tray, how they were arranged. The cherry had to be right in that same spot on that butter cookie where it looks right. 
and she had this way, but when it came out to the actual experience, it was beautiful, and it was like you knew that it was a special moment that she served up to you. So that's kind of how I was raised in that kind of environment, particularly when it came to hosting parties. So when we started to host events, and a friend of mine reminded me of this the other day, I forgot all about it. She goes, the great thing about the events you threw was there's all these surprises along the way. And I never knew what was happening. Um, so here's a tip for you. If you live in a, if you work in a building that has an elevator, throw an event, and I'll let you borrow this, have elevator cocktails. We actually lived, we had, a, we had an office that was on the second story, and we started opening, just basically doing open houses. And we got known in Louisville for hashtag elevator cocktails, because when you walked in the lobby, we would have a table sitting there with cocktails ready for you. We had a recipe card, and it was literally, it was from first floor to second floor. But our thing was, you need a cocktail to get from the first floor to the second floor. And we became known for that, but it also set the mood for how people were going to experience things. And this wasn't with the whiskey chicks. This was my business exequity that we did this for. And it wasn't about the alcohol. It was about the experience. And so from then on, we would do these surprise and delights. And we became known for those special moments that the client wouldn't expect. And that applied in the whiskey chicks and also applied in our business. One time we had an event and we were going to do a tour. And the way the friend described it to me the other day, she goes, I showed up, I'm thinking we're going to get on a bus and we're going to drive for an hour to Bardstown. But instead, we had a food truck out front with hot donuts that were custom made for you to get your donut before you got on the, the bus. So I'm not saying that everybody needs to get a, a, um, a donut truck and you don't have to necessarily go out and serve cocktails to all your clients, but it's thinking about those little things that are going to make a difference, that are going to make them stand out and to remember you. I still, to this day, I haven't been in that space for five years, and I still run into people and like, you're the one with the elevator cocktails. Now, I'd like them to remember a little bit more than the elevator cocktails, but I'll take that. So we started creating these experiences, and we created experiences. One of my big things is I wanted them to be fun and approachable. I wanted people to be able to walk in and feel comfortable. And in order to do that, we had to make sure we created an environment where people did feel comfortable. And a couple of things that, that made the difference in that was we had one big rule when you came to one of our events. If you didn't know the person next to you, you needed to introduce yourself. If you saw somebody there that was by themselves, you need to go and make sure you welcome them to the event. We would do these events where we would go, okay, they were pub crawls, we called them struts because we were whiskey chicks. Um, but we would do these pub crawls, and one of the rules was you couldn't sit next to the person you came with at any of these spots. You had to sit next to somebody new. Now, that's not necessarily what you're going to do when you're bringing a bunch of clients together. You're, you know, go sit next to that person versus that one. But it's trying to find ways for people to interact and to engage. So we threw these events, and what happened along the way was something I didn't expect, which is... I saw women begin to transform. I started to see women who were in a place of, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm intimidated by this. I'm afraid of bourbon. And it really was a fear because it was something I wanted to experience. I wanted to know something about it. But I was afraid to take that first sip. And what if I did it wrong? Because you know there's a right or wrong way to drink bourbon. Actually, there's not. The right way to drink bourbon is the way you like to drink bourbon. But sometimes in Louisville, you get the, oh, no, you got to drink it this way, you got to drink it this way. And there are some aficionados that will tell you how to drink it their way. But you know what? It's just like anything else. You've got to experience it your way and what makes you feel comfortable. So we did this one tour. We went to Maker's Mark. And one of my good friends had dragged her sister there. Her sister went kicking and screaming. And the only reason why she went was because her mom went too. And they were going to make it like this girl's trip and going on this tour. She hated bourbon. She's like, that's the nastiest thing I've ever had. She was thinking Jack Daniels, which, by the way, is not bourbon. Um, that is Tennessee whiskey, and we don't claim it. Still good stuff. But so she, ref she was like, I didn't want to do it. Well, what happened is we started to ease her into it. And so she went on this experience. We went to the distillery. It was an amazing experience. They rolled out the red carpet for us. And we started to work her way into it. 
And she started to have these moments along the way that started to feel a little more approachable. Like she got to see how it was made. She got to see behind the scenes of how all this stuff got made. And there's these big vats that have all of the grains and the mash bill all boiling up in it. And she actually was able to dip her finger in and taste it. She's like, well, that's not too bad. It tastes like bread. It tastes like a really weedy bread. So she, her interest has peaked a little bit, right? So she goes on, and we go into this big tasting room, and, and they did it right. They eased her way into the tasting. We had a cocktail. We worked our way into it. And they shared why she was there. What should you experience? How should you do this? And it wasn't just throw you in there and take a drink. It was easing her into it. By the end, she was dipping her own wax bottle, her own bottle in the red hot wax and walked away with a couple bottles of bourbon. The next day, I found out she had gone to the liquor store and had bought like five different bottles of bourbon so she could taste different ones and figure out what she liked and what she didn't like. So fast forward a little bit, and she is going through a divorce. And if anybody's been through a divorce, it's like the most, you know, moment where it can be the lowest moment in your life. Your confidence is horrible. Um, and she was going on her first blind date. She goes on her first blind date. She gets to the place early. She goes up to the bar, and she goes, you know what? I want a Blanton's on the rock. For those of you guys who don't know, Blanton's is a very high-end bourbon, and it's one that's very well sought out. So she's standing at the bar, drinking her Blanton's, and her date shows up. Was, she got him off a dating app, and one thing she was relieved is that he actually looked like what was on the dating app. He was quite handsome. Um, he was an ex-baseball player, so very athletic, very handsome man, comes up and says, hi, um, you know, I'm, I'm your date. And he goes, what are you drinking? And she says, well, I'm drinking a Blanton's on the rock. And he says, well, isn't that a, aren't you a badass? So she went from a place of lack of confidence to this place of strength. And that's kind of the origin story of where bourbon badass came from. And I actually wrote a book on how to be a bourbon badass. If you were one of the lucky people that bombarded me in the lobby and got one of the books, um, it's, it's a fun book, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. Uh, but that whole thing about knowledge and experience breeds confidence, that's something that we all need to keep in mind when we're dealing with our business owners. Our business owners are not in a place of confidence when it comes to selling their business. It's a scary place. And our job as advisors is to figure out how do we ease them along with that? How do we take our experiences? We combine that with meeting them where they are and remembering they don't know everything we do. They don't know the language. They don't know the vernacular. And I will tell you, after I did my SEPA course, my head was spinning. I've been in business for 20-some years, and I'm like, okay, trigger of it? Now i got to figure out what that is. Valuation? Um, then you started going and discounted cash flow and all this other stuff. And so... It took me a while to get up on the vernacular, but look at it from a business owner standpoint who, frankly, guys, how many of your business owners really know what EBITDA is? Many of them don't even know what that is, and you're talking, yeah, it's four times EBITDA. They're like, what is that? And then you could call it EBITDA and really confuse them. So the piece there is to remember that knowledge and experience breeds that confidence, and our job is to share with them the knowledge and the experience. And I'm going to leave you with the last thing, which is all boats rise. And I tell the story about what attracted me to SEPA, and I think it just exemplifies this all boats rise, is the fact that it was built around collaboration. It started with that holistic view, and then it became the collaboration that it takes a village. And I was in corporate America for 20 years. I dealt with some of the biggest telecom companies out there. I dealt with big named technology companies, Panasonic, Sanyo, Sony. We had to have lockdowns on floors. We couldn't have same customer care reps in the building with other of competitors. So everybody did everything separately. There was not collaboration. It was pretty darn competitive. So if you can imagine, I went into the distilleries and they had everything that they collaborate on. And it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen that a distillery will go out of their way to actually take care of another distillery if they have a part or a piece missing. They will take things off their line and give it to the guy down the street. And the thing that I love about SEPA and I love what we do here is the fact that's the same thing. If we know something, we're open to sharing it and really thinking about how all boats rise in this industry. 
So with that, thank you, and I appreciate you.